Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with horror enthusiast Michael Kester. Oh, hi, everyone. Once again, uh, coming back for another great episode. That's uh, right. Double feature. Double feature. We're doing something a little weird today that I actually resisted on the show before. Why am I taking blame? That our producer resisted yeah, it was our producer. on the show before. Which, by the way, before, what, what, what's the movies? What are we... Today we're going to do May and Teeth. All right, I'll get back to that. There's more exciting news. We have a new producer today. We do have a new producer. The Honey Bear. I'm, uh, I'm once again sick. Yeah. So my plan is to take this... And I fell for it, too. I went to the store last night, and they had a bottle of honey, huge tub of honey for $2, or a tiny bear-shaped bottle of honey for $4. So I bought the bear-shaped bottle right, of honey. sure. My plan, since I am so deathly ill, once again, as always on this fucking show, is, uh, and I only get sick when we record. Yeah, you really do. Six days of the week, I'm fine. One day of the week, I'm fucking sick. So my plan is, every time you're talking, I'm going to do a shot of this honey. Do it. And hope that, now this is your advice, because you sing. Yeah. You're in a band. I'm in a band. I sing, and drinking honey is the only way to keep your throat from just bleeding. <laughs> Have you, um... Have you had that problem when you... I, you guys record all the time. You have, yeah. what, 10 EPs or something? Yeah, something like that. All right. So have you had to down the honey before? Or well, the is thing this... is, I I would never... I'm not the kind of person... So I'm not trying to take this out on you, but oh, I thanks, wouldn't asshole. record sick. Oh. But that's because it's a band thing. It's not a podcast We thing. don't have it's an option. It's a one chance. We need a show every single week. We but cannot possibly last. Performing, I've, I've honey guzzled <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times. Speaking of honey guzzling, there's going to be some spoilers in here. We're talking about May and Teeth. Now, this was something that uh, the producer said no before. Yeah. For a couple reasons. Now, we did Teeth. Yeah. No, we didn't do Teeth. We did May. We did May. Let's try that again. Now, we did May. Right. For uh, the Music Box Massacre. Right. Music Box Massacre 4, which came out year two, which was one year ago. Oh, Jesus Christ. And uh, that was a terrible show. And a by partridge the way. in a pear don't, tree. Don't listen to the Music Box Massacre show. It was awful. But um, we talked about May and. I was worried that we would be redundant. We didn't yeah. actually talk about May at No, all. we talked kind of about the Music Box Massacre and the fact that the director didn't show up. That was it. That was a whole conversation. People used to listen to the show. Can you <sighs> believe that shit? Anyway, so we're going to do May again. You actually did May and Teeth as a double feature I at did. your place. At my apartment, I did a May and Teeth double feature. And while I loved that idea yeah. for the show... Uh, the producer is an asshole, and right. um, she was just being a big cunt and right. wouldn't let us record it. But our new producer's a sweetheart. Yeah, God. If our producer ever shows up back in the studio, she's going to be really pissed that we replaced her with a tiny plastic bottle of honey. All right, so there's going to be some definitive spoilers. Yes. And uh, I'm going to say heavy spoilers for both movies. Yep. Now, May, uh, May doesn't get really horror until kind of toward the end, I guess. Very end. So a lot of times, if you're a horror audience... If uh, if you're into that stuff and someone's trying to get you to watch May, they will describe the end of the movie in order to get you to watch it. So you may have already been spoiled. But if you don't know much about May or what happens in it or that there's... It, here's the thing, right? If you know there's horror elements and you know what those are, you know the end of the movie. Yep. Um, I guess. I don't... Mm -hmm. Just don't fucking listen to the show if you haven't seen it. Use the chapters. There's chapters embedded in the podcast. You can uh, go to the chapters menu or use your iPod, iPhone, iPad, Zune, not Zune, not sorry, Zune. the lyric section in your Zune, I guess. Timestamps. And, uh, and just move right along. Don't fucking spoil yourself. Watch these movies. They're worth your time. So we're going to talk about May 1st. What happens on May 1st? Fuck you. <laughs> Little low-hanging fruit there. What did I tell you? Only vagina humor on the I'm show sorry. today. I'm sorry. So I guess the idea just of the day. Just that time of the month. God damn it. <laughs> We have to get through this whole show. You know, that, those that, are the right? only two I, I have. So can we start the show with our past mistakes of bitching about Lucky McKee? Yeah. All the time? It's just he didn't, get it back out of the way. He didn't show up to our show today. What a jerk. It, what, did you get stuck by another traffic? I think traffic? It was, traffic. was it traffic? Yeah, it was traffic. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so Lucky McKee did a bunch of other stuff that we didn't. This is how good our show used to be. We said he did a bunch of other stuff, and then we didn't describe what that was. Uh -huh. People may have actually seen these other movies. 
and one of them. Yeah, well, maybe one or maybe even two. If they have an Xbox, they probably saw Blue Like You. Okay. Which is uh, something that when they launched the new Xbox whatever thing, they put up all these horror meets comedy shorts. If you'll remember, there was also an Adam Green one. Oh, yeah. And a James Gunn one. Yeah, yeah. So there were uh, a couple different ones of, you know, mixed level of awesomeness. And then he did, I know you love the Masters of Horror series. Yeah, he did Sick Girl, which had have you seen that? I haven't it. seen that. It's okay. Yeah, I have. Uh, uh, I've I've rallied against and for the Masters of Horror, depending on my mood. Yeah, right. uh, Today, I'm kind of feeling a little blasé. Sure. So I'm going to just go ahead and say the Masters of Horror is doing something that isn't being done other places. I think that's actually one of the nicest things you've ever said about it. And then the big movies, there was uh, Red, yeah. which I did see. Red is more of a kind of a small town story. That's more his of newest that. film. And I thought that was good, although it wasn't the Lucky McKee. I keep trying to find May again. Mm-hmm. keep trying to find another movie like May because it's so fucking amazing. And, uh, and that's hard to do. Yeah. And Red wasn't that, although it was good. It wasn't that. Right. And then there was The Woods. Yeah. And The Woods is kind of like, it, you know, I want to combine Red and The Woods. I want the story of Red and the aesthetic and the, um, the kind of... Tree witchery? No, not tree witchery. That's oh, okay. what I want to do away with. But rather the the technical aspects of me. Oh, okay. I like the uh, I like the sound. I like the visuals. I like the. I, I guess I don't have any problem with the actors in mm-hmm. the woods. It's about trees and with the tree witchery. Witchcraft, I yeah. just there's no. I, I. What are you gonna do? There's also a movie called All Cheerleaders Die, which I haven't seen. I can't fucking get a hold of it's this. It's true thing. though. Yeah, the I true can't. Title. It, it it is true. Cheerleaders. Filmmakers, podcasters, uh, podcast listeners, everyone, everywhere, everything fucking ends. Anyways, not a downer note to continue on. Thanks for just fucking bringing this whole thing down. Um, Lucky McKee is the guy in the elevator in mm-hmm. May. That's Making how you out. can. Yeah. So if you see that guy wandering around on the streets, tell him to get back to work and at least, I don't know, find a way to release all cheerleaders die. Or make some more movies. Tell him He's to probably... take the fucking train is what you need to tell him to do. <laughs> yeah, right. He he takes the elevator everywhere he goes, yeah. and that's he why takes he takes the never elevator in cars. Time. So he's stuck in traffic and making out in elevators. How many times have you been in an elevator and you can't get out because some chick's just making out with you? Uh. Anyways, we get a flying tom tom in this film. Yeah, and we haven't called out a flying tom tom. I think it's been a while. It could have been just last week because I'm so sick that I have no idea what's happening anymore. But the bloody eye scene. Yeah. And how awesome is that, by the way, to start the movie with that? It's horrendous. You have a great scare shot right at the beginning. We haven't set any kind of tone or pacing. You know, we haven't established this this lazy shoegaze mood that we're going to get into. Uh, Instead, we just start the movie and there's blood in the eye and screaming and then stop. For a couple seconds. I mean, it's not right. even, it's so momentary. But that's the only glimpse we get of what the film's eventually going to get to. It, it's almost as if that weren't there. By the time the film rounds out its last few minutes, you wouldn't, it, it would almost seem unfair. It would seem like the film had served you up a different meal. It's something that goes unsaid about the flying Tom Tom, but you put it there to not only to remind people that later you're going to come around to that. But to give people maybe a glimpse of the climax, to give them um, a glimpse of the mood at the end of the film and how bad things are going to get. So you have this sense of foreboding the entire time. And so the whole time the movie's playing, we know things are going to get really bad. Even if, you know, that moment was so fleeting, we don't remember exactly what the awful moment was that happened for two seconds at the beginning of Mm -hmm. the film. We just know we're going to get back there. And of course, we have the usual flying Tom Tom we feel slightly rewarded or we get a moment of uh, Eureka. I guess it's kind of Eureka when, you know, we actually see the scene. Hey, that's the scene from the beginning. Thanks, Flying Tom Tom. That's a million dollar hotel reference, yeah, right? A million Still a million hotel. dollar hotel reference. Jeremy Davies. So after that, we see May as a child and uh, with an eye patch. For some reason, I really enjoy May with an eye patch as, as a, a child. pirate patch. It's referred to as a pirate patch. I'm sorry, sir. A pirate patch. And we also see the doll. And mm-hmm. the doll, um, in pristine condition, mm-hmm. the next time we see the doll, as uh, when May is an adult, it has a crack in it. Yeah. The crack is never explained. Now, you start to see more cracks as sure. the movie goes on. And we'll start to... Well, some of them are, some of them are oddly natural. Yeah. Sometimes it just cuts back to the case and it's cracking or cracked. Right. Other times, May has punched 
sure. the fucking case. And so the cracks kind of. So it could be a couple different reasons mm-hmm. it's there. It just shows you, you know, the next time you go through and watch this movie, you have some ideas about where the cracks are going to yeah. come from. So you know the first time you see the doll, this has been, we're not starting at the true beginning of the story. We are missing a piece in here somewhere that explains a little bit more that the movie's just opted out of showing. Yeah, of. It's, it's essentially like the film is showing the beginning of the end. Yeah, yeah, it very much is. It's these little details that, you know, that say uh, not only that sense of foreboding that you're talking about, but also this has happened before. We're not going to clue you in on this. It's just something to, I guess it's something to watch out for as the movie goes on. So after the little pirate patch girl grows up, she grows up into a full-fledged Angela Bettis, who's the actor that plays May. And is so awesomely awkward. Oh my god. She's so great at it. She's a great, great performer. Now there was a movie that she did, that she directed, and that Lucky McKee, he acted in it, right? Yeah. I still haven't seen this. What was it called? he wrote it too. It's called Roman. All right, I'm going to have to see that because yeah. that sounds like an amazing time. I haven't seen it either, but I've read a lot about it. Yeah, she um, she shows up in a lot of Lucky McKee's yeah. work, as do the people who make the music and a lot of his crew Right, kind of um, travels from film to film with him. Yeah, she she shows up here and there. The, the one other film other than May that I really remember seeing her in is Girl Interrupted. Oh, yeah, yeah. Girl Interrupted is really the go-to for the buffet of good female actresses. Yeah, it um, so is. Mostly the kind of background cast, but, you know, the other leads do a great job, That's too. Um, Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie Haiti is well. in it. Um, Winona Ryder. Mm-hmm. Brittany Murphy. Yeah. And Angela Bettis. Whoopi Goldberg's in it. Jared Leto's <laughs> in it. I mean, the cast is insane when yeah. you think yeah, about this Yeah, it's pretty film. crazy. But um, I don't know. Maybe someday we'll cover Girl Interrupted. We There's something should, to say because there. I love uh, just uh, especially Angelina Jolie in that yeah. movie as one of those actors that you know. If you haven't seen Girl Interrupted, you see a lot of movies that Angelina Jolie is in, and if you're anything like myself, you go, "What's the big deal?" Yeah, I love Angelina Jolie. We could talk about all sorts of weird Ayn Rand stuff all day. Me and you, or me and Angelina uh-huh. Jolie, or me and you about Angelina Jolie. Right. But as far as the acting goes, a lot of the movies she's in, she's great in, they're mediocre films. Yeah. And then you see something like Girl Interrupted, and she is stellar. And yeah. And the movie is good. Yeah, we'll have to come around to that. Yeah. We'll add that to that list of things we keep saying we're going to do sure. and then forget about when we draft up the sure. schedule for our show. But I think that I think that the performance of Angelina Jolie in Girl Interrupted is just absolutely analogous to how Angela Bettis is in May, where she just fucking makes the movie. Yeah, yeah. There is nobody that could have filled the role better. And I mean, and it's not without, it's not, the rest of the cast is not without merit. It's a small cast. There's really only two or three other big roles. Well, in there's the uh, Jeremy Sisto. Right. Who, who plays everybody Adam. knows from The Thirst, right? Is that? Jeremy Sisto's in Wrong Turn. Um, okay. I think he played Jesus or Jesus's dad in something he's uh he's been in six feet under uh-huh. if you saw the hbo right. series six feet under that went something like five or six years and uh, was really good in it was really really good in it and he's another thing that i mean i don't want to discredit angela at all but he helps make the movie sure it's his responses to how awkward yep. she is you know we mentioned in the beginning that it doesn't get horror until kind of the end mm-hmm. that whole section before the horror starts a lot of that is carried by their dynamic, yeah. you know, the relationship between the two of them or just seeing, you know, seeing May interact in a normal society. She has to be so good at that, that it can carry the movie up till we get to the slicing and dicing, right? which is, you know, in a normal slasher kind of film, uh-huh. that's what you watch the entire time, right? That is the movie. And yeah. that's not the case here at all. No. Well, then there's a tertiary role that's filled by Anna Ferris, who has since gone off the deep end and been like, what was it called? Like sorority bunny or something uh, house bunny i oh, believe was the name that of that shit. movie like what i never happened saw that. to her i don't even know what that is she's in i think she's in the scary movies now. she too. is in a lot of them she's done a lot of shit and she's not bad i like her in this movie every time she pops up i'm excited i want to hear her stupid phone sex voice yeah. and talking about pussy all of her one-liners are incredible yeah <laughs> there are one-liners that anna ferris delivers in may that i use in everyday life like what's the haps doll Oh, man. I use that all the time. Or do you like pussy? Um, <laughs> those are just some phrases off the top of my head that I I'll just I'll have to use. use that one. Does that work pretty well it for you? It works great. Um, and then if you get a weird look, you just say cats. But the thing, I think the strongest relationship in the film is definitely Adam and May. 
Michael, you're forgetting James Duvall, who is oh, not God. very important. But you know you get excited when his character shows up. For one reason and one reason only. You mean two icy reasons. Two I icy <laughs> Two icy reasons. James Duvall shows up uh, late into the film when we just need to see May interact with somebody who is an Adam. Just need uh, a couple more people for her to kind of come up against. Sort of reminds me, I guess a lot of parts of this movie kind of remind me of Secretary. Yeah. That period where Maggie Gyllenhaal's character is going out and finding other people. And so James Duvall is the guy with the crazy punk outfit and the super wax gelled hair. Yeah. He was, uh, he was Frank the Bunny mm -hmm. from Donnie Darko. But he was also in The Doom Generation. Yeah. That super, super old, can't get a hold of an awesome copy uh, cult film that was kind of part of that era of SLC punk. And hackers. And, yeah, and the movie Go, just that, that whole kind of grungy, uh, I hate to keep using the term punk over and over, but I think that's what a lot of, that, uh, a lot of those movies were. But you're trying to talk about something more important than James Duvall's uh, pseudo cameo. Right. It's not a cameo. <laughs> it's it's almost just a cameo. Okay, fine. He comes in, he rubs ice on his nipples, he gets stabbed, that's the end of him. Yeah, but more importantly than anybody with hard, icy nipples getting stabbed in the forehead... Oh my god. ...is um, Adam and May in this movie. It's a really odd dynamic that I think unfolds more interestingly than any relationship I've seen in a film. The beginning of... The whole interaction starts with May being weird. Yeah. Starts with her having a, quote, date where she intends <laughs> on blinking at Adam with her new contact lenses. Yeah. Which, in retrospect, is really strange because when that actually works out and she bumps into him a little bit later, she doesn't say anything. No. So had that worked out and he looked at her, she would have probably just remained silent, creating an insanely awkward scene. Yeah. But instead, she, like, rubs her face on his hand and finally meets him. Right, not creating another awkward scene, right. of course. And then finally meets him at the laundromat. And this is a weird moment where you think, oh, she finally got a chance to meet him on a natural level. She'll be able to clear up all the weird stuff. This might actually be okay. It might work in her favor. This is May we're talking about. So she just keeps being weird, <laughs> right. and he just kind of keeps going with it. Yeah, he's all right with because it. Because he's into weird. He likes weird. Yeah. He's a Dario Argento guy, uh -oh. and weird is just right up his alley. So, But you can see somehow, I'm not an actor, but you can see his brain kind of cranking this is too weird for me, but I like weird. <laughs> right, you know what right. I mean? You can see him being in over his head and just acting like, oh, no, I'm a Dario Argento guy. I like right. weird stuff. Sure, sure. Almost as if he has a, a reputation to live exactly. up to. And eventually he clearly gets in way over his head after he shows May the uh, hanky-panky video. <laughs> right. No matter how far-fetched it may be. Yeah, there's a great scene following that. Um, a little while later, where May bites him. And that's the point where it becomes too weird. Official, I think that's what he says. <laughs> right. Or not that weird. Right, right. She thinks it's sexy, and he says, I need a towel. Mm -hmm. And that's so great, too, because, you know, people who make these horror films are actually pretty tame in reality. Right. When you watch interviews with them, or if you've had the pleasure to meet any of these people, I think of Stuart Gordon all the right. time, where, you know, just my short little interaction talking to him was he was so normal and talked so completely calm and cool about the most disturbing things he's ever put in movies. Yeah. Uh, Eli Roth is another great example of someone who seems like he would be a complete psychopath in real life and does have a lot of really bizarre interests, but is a total level human being. Mm -hmm. The people who make these movies aren't as insane as you would imagine them to be. Well, you can't be. The, the, no, you can't, or you don't about, make a movie. The thing about making a successful horror film is if you're too weird, people aren't going to watch your movie. <laughs> right. You have to at least be able to identify with a normal human audience. Yeah. And that's why these people have to have a basis in reality. Otherwise, they have no reference point for sure. what's fucked up or what's strange. I think you also spend most of your time putting a drill in people's head and not making films. I don't know if making films is really the... The top priority of psychopaths. You didn't see the movie Ted Bundy made? Not on Netflix. Didn't see it. I really hope people go out and look for this fictional movie you just made up that Ted Bundy made. They're going to be searching Google right I'm now. I'm just going to make it and leak it somewhere. Super lo-fi. If anyone actually listened to the show, that, uh, that viral marketing idea might work. I'm the same way where I don't know anything about actors. 
and the word chemistry gets thrown around a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk about that a lot with uh, with classic films, or I guess romantic comedies get that a lot. And I don't know if there's a technical aspect to making chemistry. If you can edit around chemistry, or if you can light chemistry. Sure. I have this feeling that there's or nothing. Even if there's a way to direct chemistry. Well, yeah, that, I guess that's the most obvious one. The the one I should have gone to first. But I just mean when you're looking at a frame and it has two people who have chemistry in it, I'm not exactly sure if that means anything beyond magic. You know, I'm not sure if that's an idea of one true love or of fucking astrology or, you know, it, these kind of magical ideas about romance. And I don't know if people can really, I, they have to fake chemistry because that's what acting is. But if anyone ever had chemistry, May and Adam have some fucking chemistry. Oh, yeah. You can just watch these two in a scene doing anything, you know, laundry or whatever, watching his reactions to what she's doing. And they're just, they're right there. Everything clicks, even in the, in the times when, you know, that very clicking is the fact that they don't gel together at yeah, all. Yeah, exactly. That they are, <laughs> that he can't be with her. She is fucking weird. One of the moments I really like is when they bond over uh, him teaching May to smoke. Right. Which is something that's really strange. She almost learns to smoke in order to impress him. Yeah, to be cool. It's just so hip in how not okay it is. And I feel like maybe that couldn't happen in a movie today. You know, that's probably not true anytime anyone says something like that. But just with the way the ratings board is cracked down and of all the things that are so not okay in this movie... You know, that at the time it came out wasn't that disturbing. But now the fact that that they're bonding over him teaching her how to smoke, it just seems so wrong. And it's so great in how wrong it is. You know, when you think about the other stuff in the movie that just strikes you as wrong, I think the children playing in the glass has to be the fucking blind children crawling around in the glass. Uh, You know, the haunting music that's behind that, treating the scene Almost like there's nothing wrong with it. It's just... Um, that is one of the most fucked up parts in the whole movie. And it's, it really it's only is. compounded by May rubbing glass in her eye. Oh, God, it's I know. It's just insult to injury at that yeah, point. Yeah, it really is. But that's part of, I guess, um, you know, two of my favorite scenes that go back to back. You know, there's also a scene where she's talking to Adam in the bathroom. And the camera, the, the movie is just cutting between the bathroom and the closet. And it's flickering just between the two as we saw in the beginning of the movie, these very, very momentary, um, it it just lingers there long enough for you to know what you're looking at. And beyond that, it jumps right back to the bathroom. The shower curtain is mostly closed. It's a very claustrophobic kind of composition for that frame. She's in this tiny little narrow margin of the frame here, stuck there with the phone. You're cutting back to the closet, which is naturally a very claustrophobic mm-hmm. place. Where there's glass and, cracking. Yeah, and moving back and forth. And it's both the edits and, I guess, the, the like I said, the composition of the frame. And those two things, from a design kind of standpoint, from when earlier I mentioned the, the technical aspect of the film, that's just, he has this kind of eye. And the crew working around him just knows how to, to, to put this thing together in such a way where I feel like the decisions he's making are not only aesthetically pleasing, but really, really effective. You know, to take a frame and to say, all right, it's boring just to have an empty bathroom. I'm going to put a shower curtain here. But to also, I mean, that is the scene that you want to feel claustrophobic. And mm-hmm. so it has that, that double purpose of not just looking nice in the movie and combining the whites and the reds of the curtain and what yeah. have you, but also to make the audience feel cramped. It kind of reminds me of, you know, some of the older Roman Polanski, like, apartment trilogy sure. sort of stuff. Another thing is um, is the lighting, the spotlight type of lighting that I know I've mentioned on the show before that I really love. And you don't get much of it in the beginning. It's mostly just when you're on the doll. You know, the doll is, uh, is spotlight in such a way that kind of gives it a bit more depth, a bit more detail. And then you spend most of the movie hanging out with May. You're outside, you're in the clinic, things are okay. But there are dark moments where everything in the frame goes black. And all you have, especially towards the end, is a single spotlight on her face. And that's something that sets the mood, I think, right alongside, you know, other things like editing or the music that's really, really effective. You know some of the music stuff a little bit better than I do. Yeah, well, there's, I think, three or four tracks of the uh, soundtrack. I I guess 
tracks. I don't know how soundtracks work either. Um, but there are four breeder songs right in this movie. That quite that, a few. That much I know. Um, the music is very laid back. It's kind of I don't know if you ever got into the band um, Scarling. Not so much. I like Scarling a lot. It's one of those bands you ever hear a band and just go, man, they need more than two albums. Yes, they need about ten sometimes. albums. And uh, and sometimes you get ten albums and you don't actually need ten albums. Two albums, would but have been good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two albums is a pretty good good place to be in. But it's this genre of music that I wish I knew better so much. Just this kind of laid back, uh, something a little off about it. It seems a little, I mean, in this movie, when you get stuff, you know, the score, especially it's playful in parts. It's got that xylophone Mm -hmm. that makes it a little playful, but it's also very, very dark. There's a childlike innocence about it. And then there's also something brooding and mean and something is coming and here it's done well. And I think it's one of the most incredibly effective parts of the movie. For sure. Do you know anything else about the breeders specifically? The really the big thing about the breeders is I think they only had one real record. I mean, they might have seen like nowadays. You know how bands break up after a year and then and they then get, back get back together. together. We live and, in Chicago, so I'm well aware yeah, of that. Yeah, the bands get back together and everybody's fat and bald, and they <laughs> oh, just God. like release another album. And you really, just, you didn't think that was that was subtle enough. You just had to. I was actually talking about the Pixies. Oh God, but um. The thing about the Breeders is they released the re- the record with all the tracks from May came out. I can't think of the name right mm-hmm. now. It I believe was, it was called May the soundtrack. Yeah, something like that. Um, but it's really laid back and kind of like shoegazy. It's the beginning yeah. of what became the indie movement of right. music. I'm gonna go off on the indie mu- movement of music if I may. I'll make it very quick. I hate it, uh-huh. not because I hate independent music, but because indie is now a genre and yeah. not a business model. And indie music now means, oh, let's just put some songs together and make it sound like we don't care. I hate it. I hate it. But I digress. Let's get back to this. We're, this is a movie podcast? Yes, it did. Films. You know, I was going to save my oh, with the teeth a joke for when we actually talk about teeth, but you might force my hand early here. There's also Jay Laquette, who goes by a couple different names. What is it? Uh, Paparatic? Was that Paparatic, the name of the... Yeah. yeah, the actual group name she uses. And she was the composer for this and some other Lucky McKee stuff, which is where a lot of the, I think, the pieces that are kind of xylophone and a little bit of um, like a youth choir kind of sound mm-hmm. to it, where that comes from. Really good stuff. But beyond even the music, the whole soundscape of the movie, I mean, the, the, the mix that has that low, ominous booming to it, the subwoofer was just going insane yeah. as we were watching it in the studio, or the sound of the glass cracking that you get. These things that would normally be um, reserved for, you know, simple Foley uh, items mm-hmm. that kind of disappear into the background yeah. that are to be unnoticed. They're really pulled to the front of the mix so that they upset you. <laughs> the yeah. idea is that they are supposed to disturb you, but they never sound out it's, of place. It's kind of like the opposite of the uh, the Christmas on Mars aesthetic. Oh yeah, where yeah. Christmas on Mars is like let's use every frequency so right. that you are really feeling what's going on yeah, yeah. with the brilliance of all of this crazy space Christmas shit. Yeah. And May is the opposite. It's we're going to use every frequency we can to make sure you feel queasy. Well, yeah. And I guess I didn't even think about that, but I was just talking about low ominous boom sound and high pitched glass cracking sound. And they do cover quite a variety of different things that just make the hairs on your body stand up in an awkward, awful way. That's hard to do. I've only done Foley once for anything. I did Foley for a short, and I had to do it by myself. I had no kind of crew, and I basically had no idea what I was doing. I did it once when I was in school. Was it as hard for you as it it was fucking impossible for me? I was bored. Like, I hated hated school. Yeah, I didn't do it for school, so that's probably why it was... Anything I did in school, no matter how great or fantastic it turned out. Yeah, right. No, I hear you. I was on a three-day crunch to do this other thing. And it, um, I guess it was still fun. It was still a lot of fun. It was just really hard. And one of the hardest parts for me was trying to get the Foley to sound natural. It's a lot more difficult than you might think. And even just things like level, you don't want it to be, obviously you don't want it to be too loud. And so somehow May puts these things in the right places, even though they're not mixed, you can't just look up textbook, mix it, and then send it off. It was as uh, Spiral once described, you know, knowing the rules of jazz so that you can break them. It seems like the team who did this movie is so technically proficient that they can choose to betray different rules to have a greater impact on the audience. 
All right, so that's visuals, that's sound. We know who's in the movie. We know what's going on. There's one other thing, though, that's always really, really charming about May that I forget about, which is the dark humor element of the movie. The three-legged dog. Oh, my God, the three-legged dog makes me crack up every single... That guy's... That guy, I don't know who he is. We should have found out before we did the show. James Shame Franco's on us. brother. Who, uh, who he is. He's really good. He is good. He has about three seconds of screen time, and I love it every time it comes up. More than I love even the icy nipples part. Icy nipples When is he's good. describing, his, and it's, it's painful because he has to do it twice, right? Mm-hmm. And he has to describe the three-legged dog, and then Polly kind of puts that back on May. Uh, hey, can you help this guy out? I don't know what to do yeah. here. His story is so awful and um, and so bizarre. He throws a stick and nothing. <laughs> oh my God, but it's just so funny. It has It has the perfect sense of humor for you to kind of feel sympathy or identify with someone like May because May would almost find these things funny if she wasn't faced with them in day-to-day life. Uh-huh. It's the sort of things that make her like the Dario Argento-esque. Yeah. Uh, short that type of humor whether it's that or the children playing in glass or the kitty live now yeah i love the the aerosol on the dead cat yeah oh just perfect in in what's almost a touching moment Mm -hmm. it's does this mean we're best friends now that you've seen what's in my freezer oh god but once again there's a dual purpose you see where she's coming from you sympathize with her but she's a fucking psychopath yeah she's nuts there's no doubts that she is uh, she's not only nuts but she is dangerous yeah. and nuts. She killed this animal and she's still kind of talking to it, talking to herself, talking to this doll. And so it serves the point of being funny, mm-hmm. but also, you know, she's nuts and now violent. Right. And that sets you up for kind of the end of the film. Right. Well, the whole dynamic of the film is kind of really strange because there's this doll, the Susie doll that she gets right in the beginning of the movie. It parallels the entire film. And we talked about it cracking throughout the, the yeah, film yeah. as it goes on. One of the things that I didn't notice about the film the first time I saw it was that um, if you crank your fucking volume, Mm -hmm. certain scenes, the one that I remember particularly is right before Adam leaves after he gets bit and he's bleeding. If you crank the volume, there's the, the quick shot where the camera cuts to Susie and he says, what's that or something. Yeah. When the volume is turned up, Susie's whispering things. Really? And in that scene in particular, she's saying, don't go, don't leave me in here with her. She's, and then the door slams and you don't hear what the actual phrase is. It's weird because the doll keeps getting closer to being out of this box. Right. And as soon as it does, it envelops May and she becomes the doll. And it's just kind of this weird dynamic of may becomes the doll but what is the doll before may becomes it because it's talking and it's really supposed to be subset yeah but it's fascinating to just see this layer of the film this psychotic weird vocalization anthropomorphic whatever the fuck is going on and then when may assumes the role of the doll she's confident and fucking sexy oh it's that where yeah right when she's on the phone people up right and that's really the moment you turn. That's sure. the moment it becomes more of a slasher film. But that's a place that the story naturally has to go. Yeah. It's not as if all this time we were waiting for a horror film to show up. That's just, you. it's a fucking horror show at that point. Mm-hmm. It's naturally May's character arc. It's the only place she can go. And, you know, to talk about the, the stuff with the doll, it's really not much more than symbolic. You don't get a lot of, because so much of that, like the the doll speaking, I mean, I never even noticed that. I've seen May a ton of times. It's really under the surface. You really have to look for it. But you do get another moment that makes you question that, that's a little more blatant, which is the very end of the film, the hand coming up. Yeah. And so you don't know if that's, again, that's the movie being cute or her psychosis, or if there's something really bizarre about it. And it makes you question, what was this doll all along? It makes you question it, but it doesn't make you answer it, which I think is a a very tactful move. Really, it's another credit to Angela how different she can act, you know, when she first gets on that phone, once the killing begins. And packing all of this killing for the very end, I mean, it's a rampage that might normally fit an entire film. And if it were just a, a regular lazy horror film, it would be spread, you know, distributed evenly throughout the whole movie. But instead, it's packed at the end. 
you could call this uh, a night of terror. A girl goes around killing and collecting body parts. Mm -hmm. And that could be your pitch for this movie. But instead of stretching that out for a whole movie, they save it all for the last, what, 15 minutes or so of the movie? And then it really does feel like a rampage. It does feel like the tension that's been building the entire time. Well, really, by the end of the film, all you see is essentially just a fucking lawnmower killing every character in the movie. It's like the world is just being slaughtered because everyone you've seen throughout the film is dead in 10 minutes. Yeah, they all die. Even Jujubee's guy. I think he's credited as blank in the movie. Yeah. Um, you know, he has to die whether May ends up using any of his body parts or not. Yeah, well, she she kills him because she likes his tattoo. So the tattoo, she that's right. Takes that's right. the arms. She takes something from every, right. even the fucking cat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh God, awful. Yeah, and then you know that that moment of stillness when she goes to kill uh, Polly, when um when she's killing her girlfriend with the stems, the yeah. wheels, gams. I thought they were gams. And how the film treats that area, how it treats what happens right after that, how it treats, you know, the the walk to um, to Adam's house. Right. We've been talking for a long time about yeah. May. This has to be one of the longest conversations we've ever had about. A let's movie. let's move on from May and talk about having teeth in your genitalia. Logical next step, right? And I'm sorry. Was that a little bit? Was that not subtle enough? It was for tasteless. You? Oh, tasteless was. and not subtle. You don't want um you don't want a movie about teeth in the vagina to be subtle, do you? No. I mean, I don't know. I can't I don't know what that would look like. Well, I know Boring. what teeth in the vagina would look like, but I not a subtle see, movie about teeth in the vagina. I don't want to see gravity attached to vagina dentata. Sure. Sure. And this is um this is kind of strange the way we paired this up too. And it's the same way you did it at at your house mm-hmm. because you have this idea which is serious film first. Yep. A little easier film second because mm-hmm. that's just how the crowd, you know, that's kind of how they react. A lot of times we will do movies on the show where we start a little easy, a little accessible, and then we move into the heavy stuff. But I just felt like after the the Goliath that is May, we need to kind of decompress yeah. a little bit. And what better way to do that than a with a Titha? I told you I'd fit it in. There you go. Okay, so Teeth is actually a Trojan horse of a film. Is it? It says that it's about having teeth in your vagina mm-hmm. and it absolutely is if that's what sh- if that's the film you're looking for that's the film you're gonna see boy have i got a film for you but it's also got a lot of other kind of socio-political ideas it does. That, it, that it sneaks in there but the first and foremost thing we need to talk about is the vagina dentata myth so there's this i mean i don't know if it's really a myth the film talks about how oh in in History, people have always thought about having teeth in their vagina. That's not what's important to me. What's important to me is that that's just the kind of thing that you hear about being talked about when you're in seventh grade. Yeah, I don't know if it's really a Greek myth, but I had heard about this before. There was a, uh, when I was in high school, there was a, this is going to get really nerdy, a role-playing game Uh called, I believe it was called Vampire the Masquerade. Oh, God. And I remember I worked in the mall, right? So I'd hang out in the gaming shops and stuff on my break. And one of the uh, one of the books was censored on the back because kids fucking hang out in the mall and you can't have kids looking at vaginas. I didn't know what was under the censored part. So what did I do? Of course, I bought the book. This is odd that they would have a book that was censored, but you could see it if you bought it. It really just seemed like they were trying to entice me to purchase it. And after I bought it, it was a vagina that had teeth. Hmm. So I know at the very least, other artists have conceptualized this uh-huh. long before right. um, the movie Teeth was yeah. in existence. But I don't know if it goes all the way back to, let's say, ancient Egyptians and Christians and Native Americans and whatever else our lovely female protagonist balls out. More unbelievable to me than vaginas with teeth. And we'll, <laughs> we'll get to the biology of that. But uh, more unbelievable to me is promise rings. The promise rings. Why do those exist? Jonas Brothers. That's a real thing. Can you believe that that is really happening? I, honestly, as the person I am, I can't knock people for wanting to have a promise. Whatever. Like, no, I can... guess there's nothing, uh, nothing on a whole that's wrong yeah. with that. I, as a movement, it, it upsets me. Yeah. But we're human beings. That's what sets us apart from animals. We can choose to be, say, monogamous. Yeah. We can choose to uh, take part in a sexual fetish that involves us abstaining until marriage Uh these are choices that we can make and just that i wouldn't knock somebody for sadomasochism right i would not knock them i guess for i would i would actually make fun of them but in theory it's fine yeah it's just strange and and a lot of it is piggybacked by a lot of stuff i don't like and that's why it's not okay exactly 
So what's wrong with the idea, the metaphor of giving a gift? Because that's what's purported in the movie. Well, because here's, for me, when you say, I think in the film she says, what do you do with a gift? Right. And for me, the answer is wrap it and give it to anyone who deserves it. Sure. Not save it for one person? No. And the reaction you get from someone when you give them a gift? Yeah. Uh, that's a pretty great, it's a pretty outstanding reaction. Yeah. If I had lots of gifts to give, I would, if giving a gift was actually as easy as fucking, uh-huh. I would give gifts all the yeah, goddamn exactly. time. Yeah, But it's difficult. You have to go out and find something specifically suited for an individual. And pay for it. Yeah, and pay for it, which is never fun. And then you have to give that to that person, which is extremely gratifying. Or what you could do is just have sex with them, Mm -hmm. because everybody loves that. Yeah. And then you don't have to purchase anything. It's free. It's fun. I mean, as a a bit of recreation or gift giving, I don't think you can come up with a lot of better ideas than sexual intercourse. Yeah. Yeah. The gift thing isn't even what bothers me. What bothers me is this purity idea. Sure. The thing about purity that drives me crazy is that fuck you. Who's to say who's pure? Fuck the right. word. Right. There is no definition that applies to a human being about purity. Right. They're saying purity. They mean virginity. Mm-hmm. They're not analogous. That's not what that you means. You can't say either or. Right. That's what really gets me about the promise ring thing is this kind of piggyback of purity and adam begot eve yeah there's a a definite religious um they beat you over the head with the religion its entire basis seems to be in religion it's not what if human beings all independently decided to save themselves for marriage it's a bunch of people are using the authority of what they call god to force people not to partake in what is pretty much one of the most awesome, enjoyable activities that two people can do. Mm -hmm. Universal activities, nonetheless, that everyone can do. Fun for the entire family. Which brings me to incest. Does watching a movie that's this tasteless, does covering that movie give me any type of artistic license to just make tasteless transitions like that or Yeah, no, I guess that works. That's excusable in this case, right? No one's gonna hold my feet to the fire there or anything. Um incest. Yeah. What the F? There's a so first off, it's not incest because I think they even did this in a Brady Bunch movie. Oh, but yeah, the brother thinks that Dawn has always wanted has been saving herself for him, and he calls her out on it in a hilarious scene. Does he genuinely think that, or is he just being a dick? He believes that. Okay, he's out of his mind. All right. Um, but it's just this weird. It seems like it's incest because I guess because they live in the same house and they've grown up together. Well, but, their parents are married, so yeah. legally it's incest. Is it? Um, I don't know. It's, I have. I, I was going to make up is. an answer, but I don't I'm actually know. I'm pretty sure That's... incest means you're related by blood. That's what it should mean. I and because they did it, in, they wouldn't be illegal in a Brady. Because otherwise, movie. it's just an extremely sexy taboo, right? Yeah, because I'm going it's by forbidden love. At I'm that going point. by it's Brady not. Bunch legality. Okay. And Brady Bunch has never done anything illegal. Oh god. So fucking your stepsister. I mean, that's fine, right? I can't distribute legal advice on this show. Well, basically, I just want to point out that they're not related by blood, so it's not incest. But maybe creepy. I mean, you grew up sure. side by side with the person. Absolutely. As a childhood friend that you live you with. You can look at the dude, sure. and I won't argue that he's creepy. Right. Well, yeah, there's that, too. Like everybody else in the movie. Yeah. Every dude in this movie. A total creep. Yeah. It's it's Okay, so there's this weird dynamic. I saw this with a bunch of friends in the theater when it first kind of did a circuit, and... My one friend, the only our our screaming friend from Hatchet, way back oh, sure. in year one. Sure, I remember her. Um, she pointed out that her biggest problem with the film was that every dude was a creep. I mean, Dawn gets raped. She gets her cunt bet on. She gets four finger fisted by right. the goddamn gynecologist. Such an exploitation, by the way, of a movie that I mean, this is such. Uh, you know, people don't understand how the movie could go to these different places. It seems so elementary to me. That's what you, once, once you have the idea of, I'm going to make a horror movie, it's going to play on the fears of the audience, and it's going to be about a vagina with teeth. You naturally go all of those places. Sure. You go to purity, you go to um, fears of the gynecologist, especially in the age demographic. Uh-huh. I think this movie was really yeah. shooting for yeah. because a lot of people had never been to a gynecologist, uh-huh. had fears of what that would be like. And so teeth is going to just blatantly exploit those sure. fears. But it, it makes for every dude to be creepy and no upstanding, it does though. Yeah. no upstanding guys. And it basically just invents scenarios for her to be able to chomp off right. penises <laughs> for revenge. And that's okay. And here's why 
is the second she meets a dude who's not creepy, the movie ends. The second she finds somebody that she doesn't You mean meet, hypothetically. Right. If she, sure, sure. Once I was she, like, when does she meet a dude that's well, not yeah. creepy? That guy doesn't exist Once in she universe. meets someone that she doesn't need to bite their dick off, right. then there's no more plot to the film. Yeah, the movie is over. And so instead, you just kind of deal with her first discovering what's going on with right. dudes and with herself. <laughs> sure, sure. When she, like, it's the first time she's ever even really seen... She sees a vagina in the book for the first time. Right. Well, she it's a state-censored vagina, so she has to get the sticker off there. That whole part of the film, I mean, the first, maybe even the first 40 minutes of the film is mocking purity, is mocking. It doesn't mock it very hard. It just kind of invokes it. It mm-hmm. sets the, uh, it gives you the setting, I sure. guess, of where they're at. But, you know, the teacher is afraid to show the vagina. Right. And, and it's a pretty terrifying looking vagina when they do get the sticker it off. It depends so, I mean, on if you squint. Is that what it depends on? Well, I don't know. The brother kind of gave it, a, gave hers a good once over. He did. He kind of peeked at it like, what's going on under here? You know, in that same section, I mean, that's right after they're talking about all the purity ring stuff and all of the, you know, saving it for one person, which is also saving it for one person. I mean, it's just a bad idea. Beyond religion, just take religion out of the equation. Saving it for the person you marry. I mean, first of all, what about divorce? It's you know, true. should you just not get divorced then? Should you stay in a marriage where you are unhappy because you just um, gave your virginity away and then there's some kind of expectation there? Well, do you remember the thing in Dirty Shame where they're talking about getting your hymen sewn back in oh, sure. and having a <laughs> right. blood pack inserted in your vagina so right, you right. fuck for the first time for the second time? You just do that with divorce. That's the correct answer. I don't, I don't think that's helping anyone. What we need is I want to make a call right now for a purity counter movement. It's fine. I'm not saying we should absolve the purity movement, but we need kids in, in high school, in middle school, who wear like uh, fucking black rings for, or maybe cock rings on their hands. You probably couldn't wear that in school, though. Does a cock ring fit on your hand? I don't think no I've way. ever actually seen a cock ring. There's no way. You'd have to have real fat hands. It's not a discussion I'm prepared to get maybe into. Maybe your big toe. But then what? You well, have then it would sandals. only work when you have sandals in the summer. All right, so let's stick with fingers. We need uh, a ring you can wear on your finger that means I will fuck on the first date. Why don't you have a ring on your finger that says I will fuck on the first date? Oh, that's good. That's a, could you get away with that in school? Why not? Would anyone call you out on that? On what? We need something that's a little more euphemistic, I think. I Ideas. will have sex with you on the first date. Can we just get like first date rings? Is that first fine? First date rings? If, it just said, if it's like a black ring and it says like first date on it. How about first mate? I just don't want to make this any harder for people. Yeah. Just some kind of visual identifier Everybody can wear in school so they know who's cool with fucking. And then we don't have to worry about the lame people and the purity movement. We can all just have sex with the cool people. No time is spent chasing around people who aren't interested in having sex with each other. It's a brilliant idea. We're onto something here. I want to see somebody like actually take this into, uh-huh. into action. Double feature show at gmail.com. It's not Get back to happen. us. It better fucking happen. I trust Podmanity. There's my first mistake. And while we're, you know, still in this classroom idea, this classroom setting, I don't know if the movie understands how evolution works. Yeah, they don't. I mean, uh, you know, right from the titles, I will go as far as that they have the the billowing smokestacks sure. in the background. Yeah, it, uh-huh, very I, funny. I think they're they're. I don't know if they're saying in lieu of evolution, this is a radioactive mutation. It's not the same thing. Yeah, they could be juggling a couple ideas. I mean, I'll go as far as to say that. Uh, some kind of radiation has mutated some DNA and that could get passed on. Sure. My suspension of disbelief goes that far. But I don't see any evolutionary advantage to a vagina with teeth. Yeah. Explain your problem and then I'll explain the only possible solution. Okay, sure. So these types of adaptations, these uh, evolutionary advantages, are only passed on when it's beneficial to procreation. Otherwise, there's no reason for that trait to continue. Right. So usually you see this in adaptation to a certain environment. I mean, if you're in a certain climate, an animal that is better adapted for that climate will survive, and thusly that animal procreates more often, and we see that animal continue on Mm -hmm. through an evolutionary chain. So when you're thinking about how these steps may have occurred, not the only way, but the most likely way, is that more of that specific adaptation procreated or more of them existed where another died off, and Mm -hmm. that's how they continued on. Right. So if there was some kind of mutation that happened to, let's say, someone's vagina, every single time they had sex, they would have a baby, 100% guaranteed. And uh, let's just say, to make it easily identifiable, the the smokestack turned their vagina blue, right? So 
Everybody with a blue vagina, once they have sex with someone else, they procreate, no matter if you're wearing a condom, no matter if the guy doesn't ejaculate, just whatever happens if there's a penis inside, you procreate. So then you're going to see tons of offspring showing up with blue vaginas right. because they would procreate more than these Someone with other teeth mates. in their vagina? Sure, who sure. Who prevents somebody from <laughs> right. ejaculating in them ever. Right. So unless we were in a situation where a girl with, a, with teeth in her vagina was a more advantageous mate mm-hmm. where more people wanted to mate with right. that girl for maybe she's secreting a certain hormone uh-huh. that you know makes men flock to her and rape her but i mean if none of these guys can conceive a child with her yeah that doesn't actually continue on sure. in any sort of biological chain the only possible way that we kind of came to the conclusion that it makes sense is that she gets to select only the ideal mates sure which means that in a different type of world where everybody was just raping everybody. Sure. She would get to prevent the weaker males or the less desirable mates from ever procreating. So right. she's essentially weeding out the males. She's not necessarily creating stronger females, but she is preventing the weak males sure. from procreating. And that's the only un- and that universe doesn't exist. Thank God. <laughs> well, what's funnier about that is that the movie invokes uh, evolution, which it doesn't have to do because that's large scale. Evolution doesn't happen in a single person in a single instant. We're talking about, you know, just in that situation you're describing, we're talking about over 500 years, over a million years. Then we would start to see, you know, a massive occurrence of women with teeth in their vagina because of that um, tendency towards that type of selection. It's just one person here, so I don't even know why we're invoking evolution. I think just because it's a natural thought that comes along with having a freak accident. Go Controversy on. at the time, too. sure. And then you end up with a superpower. Yeah, this is uh, this is an origin story yeah. of a new member of the X Men. I guess I would. Yeah, I say X Men is a is a is a good pun. I'm glad you're around to catch these. I think mm-hmm. I would just get off the hook all the time, but you're here to call me out on them. So a little confusion uh, might go through your mind as you're watching this. What causes her? Because I always think it's a it's a rape aid. Uh-huh. It's this type of thing. She's getting raped, and that's when you know that's when the teeth happen. But it appears to be anytime she's angry, even if yeah. she's not. Well, she you know, learns even, to control it by right, the end. Sure, as with any good superhero yeah. movie, the teeth is really a superhero movie. Yeah, and so at the end of the film, we kind of get this weird change in dawn right where she's in the car with the creepy old dude with the tongue mm-hmm. and he's that making guy's great by the way i don't know making, who he is but he's awesome and he's making gum slurping noises because he wants her to make cum slurping noises and essentially what goes on in her head is i can use my power anytime i want right she gives him a i'm gonna fuck you look yeah which is weird for me because her power has a certain weakness, which is that she has to be penetrated right. in order to cut off a dude's dick. So the problem herein is that she actually has to let that creepy old man's penis go inside right. of her before she can cut it off. To me, I mean, I'm not a woman. I'm never going to claim to be a woman. I don't think anyone is. I'm never going to claim to have any bearing over what it's like to be a girl. But to me, I feel like she's better off just getting out of the car. Or getting a handgun, maybe? Yeah. Is there anything she, she can do that a handgun wouldn't accomplish? No. Uh, it's more covert, and it's uh, it's probably less illegal. No laws on the books about having teeth in your vagina. Sure, I see what you're saying. And so she decides... I, I mean, it doesn't say so much, but essentially she decides, I'm going to fuck this guy and cut off his dick. That'll show him. Yeah. And I feel like that's not necessarily an <laughs> ideal course of action for anybody. Clearly not, but these aren't the concerns of teeth. That's true. I wonder about, you know, to go back to this idea of all the men being creepy, this is clearly, and, and the reason you put these uh, these movies together back when we saw them with a, a bigger group at your apartment, is kind of female empowerment. Yeah. That was the, the base double feature idea was women, you know, exacting revenge and, and what have you. Um, women who were maybe outcast by society or who were picked on. And so there is a certain element of feminine empowerment to this. But I wonder if it's not just as cheap on the opposite side to have all of the men being complete creeps. Yeah. I mean, does that effectively help you 
I guess it does. I guess in a movie like Teeth, you just want it to be easy. Yeah. Because Teeth is pretty much just the counter yeah. of all of these other types of slasher movies or horror movies where every girl is a ditz yep. or stupid or slutty or what have you. So here we have an example where all men are creeps. And I don't think the movie's making any bigger point about that. It's just that this is an easier story to tell, like you said, in an environment where every man is is fucking creepy. Yeah, that's that's about. I mean, that's all. We, that's really all we have time for. Apparently, we could go on forever on these two films, but instead, we're just gonna decide to do, I guess, what more shows, more shows, emails, um, subscribes, donates. This is usually your area, man. <clears throat> all right, here's how it goes. You do. We have a website, and then it just all takes care of itself from there. Are you ready? Yeah. We have a website. It's doublefeatureshow.com. Dot com. You got it. We also have an email. That's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. You can find us on iTunes. You can leave us a review. You can subscribe forever. You can send us a donation. And then something. What? This is something <laughs> you, you have need to me do. for this. Please. Okay. So here's how this works. You donate to the show. Donate dot com. We use that money to prolong said show and make to it procreate. more awesome. Not to procreate. That's actually free. Or, by the way, uh, condoms, Planned Parenthood, 25 cents each. Support fucking Planned Parenthood. But don't donate to them. Donate to us instead. If you have a lot of money, donate to both. Uh, Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. We're going to pick two people who donated this year. We're going to pick them fairly soon. And they're going to get to select a couple movies. We're going to pick one movie from each of those people, pair them together for a year on Double Feature. So if you keep sending us fucking emails that we ignore that say, do the human centipede or whatever stupid movie you want on our show, this is your opportunity to do that. All we're asking is that you help fund the show, which is admittedly a, a huge favor for yeah, it really is. whatever shitty thing we're going to give in return, <laughs> making fun of your stupid movie. Uh-huh. But you can do that by going to donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Uh-huh. And if you click the subscribe button on there, you actually get to record a, uh, a vocal snippet thing. You get to talk into a microphone, whether it's on the telephone or you have a mic and you can just email us an MP3. And we will stick that in the intro of said end of the year show. Great. Which leaves us with two more films that we're doing next time. Yeah. We're going to do The Social Network, which is that new Facebook movie. And then we're going to do The Hudsucker Proxy. I'm so excited. Watch more fucking film. Bye.